The topic for this session is what does disruption in healthcare mean for doctors and patients? And to stimulate our thinking, we have presentations from three people, and I will be introducing each of those in turn. Um, and to facilitate the discussion, and this is a bit like uh, watching a Viva Voce exam through one-way mirror, uh, David Pension will be coming up to uh, interrogate in the most gentle and pleasant fashion uh, each of our presenters. So to begin, um, let me just say that we've got representatives who bring the perspective of patients and doctors and those who communicate the perspectives of patients. And so our first presenter is uh, Jen Morris, who's the science communicator. And her interests are in healthcare quality and safety and consumer perspectives on a wide variety of health sector topics She's at the University of Melbourne's Centre for Health Policy and her research interests include harm in healthcare, complaint systems, complaints-based service improvement and so forth. So, um, Jen, welcome to uh, this session and we look forward now to your presentation. Okay, thank you everybody. When I was younger, my dad and I, we used to play a game we called Perpetual Newspaper, where we tried to come up with headlines, where if you printed them in a newspaper and you published that newspaper every year forever, they would always be true. Things like government promises to be tough on crime or major road project has large cost blowout. When we turn our attention to healthcare, there are so many of these perpetual headlines. Non-attendance rated outpatients, appointments growing, public health system stretched for resources, patients turning to alternative therapies in record numbers. I'm sure you can think of some of these headlines from your own area of practice. Why is it that these headlines are perpetual? Why is it that these problems in healthcare are unchanging and even self-entrenching? One could write a thesis on the many answers to that question, but I can sum up a large part of it quite simply. When the same people with the same preconceptions, the same vested interests, the same shared microculture, and the same collective mentality try to solve the same problems with the same approaches, you get the same result. Or even more simply, be the same, do the same, get the same. So how do we break the curse of same, the pattern of perpetuity? There are many answers which must be considered in addressing that particular question but I want to focus on one for a minute, which I think is best encapsulated by my friend, David de Broncart, who says, let patients help. We are the most underutilized resource in healthcare. All too often I hear and I see manifesting in the healthcare system that only health practitioners really get it, and therefore only health practitioners can really engineer improvement in healthcare. But this insular tribalism has proven self-defeating. It creates a silo of vested interests, compounding cultural inculcation, shared blind spots, inherited acrimony, and the kind of standoff games of chicken where we'll move on that issue if they move on that issue first, and then nobody does. We are in a time when other industries are lifting their gaze and looking outward for solutions. Domestic violence agencies are signing up hairdressers as community watch guards. Human trafficking authorities are training flight attendants to spot victims. And video game developers are bringing autism employment services in-house. This brings healthcare to an important precipice. Continue to look inward, throw up walls, talk in circles, and tell the community, just, just trust us. Or release that iron fist just, just a little bit, and let fresh perspectives in. Not only from quirky and courageous colleagues, some of whom we will hear from at this conference, but from the outsiders and from patients. 
But truth be told, this apparent choice is not really a choice at all because the outsiders and the patients, they're not waiting for permission. Disruption sets in when community members are faced with their own perpetual headlines. But empowered by technology and information access and that modern dose of disregard for the once matter of course subservience to institutions, just stop waiting for the system to improve itself and plaster their own solution right over the top of it. A perfect example of this is this man. I want you to remember his name. His name is Greg Owen. At the time of the story I'm about to tell you, Greg Owen was an unemployed homeless man and a former sex worker, described by his friends as rough but with a heart of gold. Owen faced his own perpetual headline about the failure of public health programs to effectively prevent HIV transmission among gay men in England. Owen, a gay man himself, did not want to be part of those statistics. So when he heard about a trial of pre-exposure HIV prophylaxis, or PrEP, he was keen to get involved, but he just missed out on being included in that study. Not long after, he found out that he had contracted HIV. Owen was, of course, devastated, but not just for himself, for his community. PrEP had been approved by the US FDA already and was being widely used there and was widely covered by health insurance companies notorious for not paying out unless they really needed to. But the NHS, in all its wonders, was dithering on this issue, on if, how and when to approve PrEP, seemingly trying to stall its approval for several years until the ingredients within it became generic and thus cheaper. It was too late for Owen. But Owen decided to facilitate access to the drug for other people from his kitchen table. He found a way to legally order PrEP online from Indian generic drug maker Kipla. The drug cost only $50 per month by this method instead of the $1,500 it cost in England. He started up a website, I Want PrEP Now, a one-stop shop for buying safe, reliable PrEP online from reputable companies. Tests showed the drugs from these companies were legitimate and uncontaminated, despite fears to the contrary. Owen had to negotiate secretly with sexual health clinics to find someone willing to provide the necessary kidney function monitoring while knowing full well that patients were requesting that monitoring because they were going to take drugs they bought off the internet. Since that time, Owen's website, along with another called PrepStar, have enabled thousands and thousands of British people, mostly gay men, to get safe and reliable access to PrEP, while the NHS in England is still dragging its feet on that issue. During the website's period of operation, rates of new HIV diagnoses in England fell by a staggering 30%, and in London's largest sexual health clinic, where this drug was most commonly used, by 40%. Owen's efforts helped PrEP reach marginalised communities and become a normal and natural part of conversation among at-risk individuals. The role of this otherwise socially invisible, disadvantaged and marginalised and unassuming man was to by bypass the bureaucratic obstacles, buck passing and legal stalling that was holding up a vital public health measure and costing lives. What Owen did would have been enough to send risk-averse, process-driven, compliance-focused authorities into total catatonia at the outrageous, unregulated nature of it all. But it worked and it made the most extraordinary impact on thousands of lives. As Will Nutland, the founder of the website Prepster put it, we were just in a meeting with bureau government bureaucrats and they were like, we can't do this. While meanwhile, we just announced a 30% drop in HIV rates from something we started at our kitchen tables. This is what patient-led healthcare improvement can look like. People often argue as though the point itself negates the validity of the trend, that pressure to disrupt or even just mildly improve healthcare is coming from changing patient expectations. Patient expectations are almost always talked about like this kind of gum on the shoe of healthcare, irritating and obstructive and increasing and unreasonable, as though if only patients didn't expect things, everything would be okay. People's experiences of life, and yes, their expectations are changing. People expect more free choice, less paternalism, more convenience, less obstruction, more autonomy, 
less enforced deference and a little bit less, just trust me. The uncomfortable truth is this. Healthcare will only get better when we start talking about patient expectations as though they are right to have them. What I'm saying isn't that every expectation of every patient at all times is perfectly reasonable. But I do want you to think about something. Healthcare is born of, and benefits from, a powerful, privileged, and frankly lucrative social contract. As do the people who work within it. We give you our trust, respect, personal and public resources, and access to ourselves at the most vulnerable times in our lives. And we expect you to keep the promises that elicited those offerings in the first place. But too often, healthcare fails to meet its side of that social contract. Patient expectations do not arise from nowhere. No baby at the moment of their birth believes that the doctor or nurse or midwife whose hands catch them is perfect, always honourable, endlessly knowledgeable, perfectly ethical and always has a solution, a treatment and an answer. Those beliefs are learned. The healthcare system has to take responsibility for its role in creating these so-called patient expectations through a carefully curated public image that comes with a potent mix of non-transparency and hesitance to admit limitations and faults. I see practitioners actively selling us an illusion, then condemning us for being unreasonable enough to believe it. And I see the community beginning to rebel against that. As a point of illustration, I've gathered some quotes from members of the community expressing these sentiments for themselves. The specialist told me not to do any internet searching. Trust me, he said. If I had taken either piece of advice, my little girl would be dead. I no longer accept that I can find out more about the quality of the hospital cafe than the surgeon operating on my daughter's brain upstairs. Regulators go on about protecting the public. I don't need protecting from the shocking revelation that not all doctors are equal or even adequate. Frankly, I need protecting from the fallacy that they are. I'm more likely to die during the four hours driving to and from my four minute your test results were normal appointment than from the perils of doing it by Skype. Greg Owen had expectations. He expected that his country's health system would give due priority to preventative health care for vulnerable populations. And when it didn't, he just went and did it himself. And he changed the perpetual headline from HIV transmission rates stubbornly stable despite public health campaigns to HIV transmission rates slashed by 30%. So ask yourself, who will be there to break down your perpetual headline and will you be ready to listen? Thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed. That's, that's a wonderful and scary set of stories. To, uh, so, we're just going to have a chat for a few minutes and I'm going to try and interrogate a uh, question, have a conversation with Jen on your behalf. So, wh what, why do you think it is that we as doctors are trained to listen to patients in terms of their signs and their symptoms reasonably well but are appalling mm. at listening to, actually, this is what I really want for me and my family, the process of care. Where, 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 is that dis where does that dissonance come from? Mm. I think that um, it's easy to forget that medicine and those professions associated with it essentially are a culture, like mm. a lot of professions are, and that you are enculturated uh, from the beginning. You know, I've, I, my brother is a doctor, and I remember watching him go through this, this process of change uh, and I listened to, you know, Medicine 101's first lecture at Monash University, and I could see from the very first day yeah. that it was, this is what our ideology is, this is what our values are, this is what we are here to do. And, and, and it's nothing wrong with that in one way, but it's about recognising that most of the patients you have are not doctors themselves, and they bring different values, different cultures. Mm. And, and for some people it is, you know, keep me alive as long as you possibly can, 
And for other people, it's actually what matters most is that I can take myself to my granddaughter's christening and after that, I'm, I'm done. And it's very difficult for people to, to feel those clashes of values, what they think is a professional responsibility and someone asking them to do something differently. Sure. So let's take this a stage further. You, 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 you eloquently said that uh, these, these behaviours, this culture is learned. Yes. We socialise ourselves into this. And if we were to assume that we, we can be quite, we can be reasonably good at listening to patients, but not as individuals, but very poor at listening to a group of people like gay young men or what, what, what is it, can you, have you seen or could you suggest some of the things that we could do to stop this appalling perpetuation of socialization where doctors are on top, not on tap? What, 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 have you seen any things that have been successful in the way that, that you know, we've seen with the, with the prep? In a kind of clinical sense? Or well, in, I was thinking in an educational sense. Educational if sense, the damage yeah. starts mm. from day one at med school and probably before, mm -hmm. then have you seen any things that have, are promising signs that actually mm. there are examples of things going well? Mm. Promising signs, yes. This particular example hasn't quite reached far enough along to, to talk sure. about outcomes. But um, it seems a minor thing, but the inclusion at several universities in Australia of uh, consumer members and community members on interview panels mm. for medical sure. school has produced some quite interesting changes in the demographics of the people being included at mm. that admission level at medical school. And obviously admission is only one sure. step, but it, it is one. And I've been that community member and I've been with other community members in that situation. And it is really interesting to watch um, the consumer say, did anybody notice this or did anybody think of this? Yeah. And all the practitioner members did not. There was a lady that I was uh, doing that with. She was an Indigenous woman, Australian Indigenous woman. And at the end of the interview, she said, did anyone else notice that the candidate did not look at me for the entire 45 minutes sure, of the sure. interview? And uh, to be fair, I hadn't noticed that either. Um, yeah. And no one else had. And it was very important for her to be able to, to make that and point. What was, it, what was it about those particular interview processes and the people who were organising mm. that made them open to what other medical schools might have thought Whoa, that's way we, we we can't you know we can't have this. This is revolutionary. Yes. So w what was it? Attitudes? Was it a bit of expectation from a dean, or was it leadership from below? Or how did that? Happen it was. Uh, it was. It was. There was a couple of individual champions within the university. I'm thinking right. of that I won't name. Um, but there was a couple of individual champions. One actually in the nursing school, mm -hmm. rather than the medical school, and, and one in the medical school. And mm. I think the push had come from the nursing school originally, talking about more that the way that. Um, some doctors had been treating nurses and whether there mm. was a way to try and deal with that. And it became part of actually maybe just average reasonable person can deal with several problems yeah. uh, in this process. So for, for that particular example, it was about the champions having the guts, frankly, because it's an incredibly difficult thing to do, to stand up to an established culture and a very respected culture and say, maybe we need to think differently. About well, it's this. very difficult. As, I mean, I've been in hospital recently. It's very difficult to say to your consultant, have you washed your hands? Yes, absolutely. You know, yeah, yeah. And I mean, tricky. I do this it's for tricky. a living yeah. and yeah. I find that hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, very, yeah. it's very difficult. So, what's the, so that's the sort of selection process mm. where... But what about how about those of us in the audience who have responsibility for curricula, yes. who are deans, or that? How, what sort of things can we start to make this sort of engagement of the, mm. the people we purport to serve, after mm. all, mm -hmm. a much more normal part of, of of education? And it may be stopping doing the damage rather than starting doing the good things. Mm. So. Have you got any practical suggestions there? Yes, I think on the stopping doing a damage thing and yeah. on something that's very simple to do, everyone can do this from tomorrow, is to think very carefully about the language that you're using to talk mm. about patients, consumers, families. That stuff like, you know, difficult, like unreasonable expectations, you know, that kind of language, talking about how they don't get it, all of those things. Um, and things like, you know, non-compliant which suggests that thou shalt comply yeah, with me. Yeah. You know, maybe, okay, patients chose not to do the treatment. And what's the other word? What would the word be? Concord? I mean, would well, we make I'm up another depend on the word sentence, like concordance? But, yeah, or, if, yeah. The, if the sentence yeah. were something like, yeah, um, you know, the patient was non-compliant with treatment, yeah. <laughs> which I see all the time, or the patient failed treatment, which is an even yeah. worse phrase, uh, it, it would be some, depending on the actual situation, something like yeah. the patient chose not to proceed with treatment, yeah. uh, the patient was having difficulty... Um, with, the, with uh, you know, the financial side of treatment. Or give yeah. us some reason as to why. You know, for some people, it's the patient had difficulty affording the medication, so ceased taking it. 
the yeah. patient had difficulty understanding the regime and clearly we didn't support them enough, so they weren't taking it. Yeah. We don't need a word. We need to talk yeah. about the reason. There's always a reason. And we may not agree with the reason, sure. but there is always a but reason. But we have to be conscious of that. Yes. I was giving a talk in the UK just before we, I came out and I was talking to some GP colleagues and I said to them, when a patient comes to see you on a Friday evening and they come in holding mm. a photocopy of the New England Journal and a photocopy of the BNJ and one from Cosmopolitan, is this A, a perfect opportunity for deep and meaningful partnership, or is it B, a patient from hell? Mm. Okay? Yep. And people, you can hear it then, people will giggle. Yeah. There's this nervous giggle that we know that we're bad at this. Yes. We know that we need a a sign on the back of the door says, trust me, I'm your patient. Yes. You know, we know these things. Yeah, and I think that one, that, that the affront that mm. is the either the genuinely knowledgeable patient yeah. or the patient who, you know, believes themselves uh, to know particular things and may have some misunderstanding, either of those things is, is confronting. Um, I've been the genuinely knowledgeable patient and you get the same response yeah. if you're genuinely knowledgeable as if, you know, you <laughs> maybe have misunderstood the nature yeah. of things. Um, what is really hard, I think, for patients, and this is another thing to your question about what you can do, is recognise that out in public, uh, when you get public messaging in the media, you always have people saying, you know, we need people to take responsibility for their own health. You know, they need to be they need to be doing what we're telling them. They need to be taking and responsibility. Then, yeah, and then as soon as we try to, <laughs> smack so, down, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so people are, are doing that because they are genuinely trying to do what they've essentially been asked mm. to do. Engage mm. with it. Listen to me. Try and learn. Try and understand. Then they do, and there's this real kind of you stepped in my sandpit kind yeah. of pushback yeah. that, that goes on. And the, the danger of that, the clinical danger of that, is they they won't stop looking up stuff online. They'll just stop telling you, yeah. and then you get people taking yeah. things yeah. that they bought on the internet and they won't tell anyone, yeah. or they read this thing and now they're following that advice, but they won't tell you because they're afraid of being shamed. Yeah. So it has a genuine clinical risk yeah. associated with it as okay. well. Well, that's mm. fantastic. Thank you so much, Jen. And. Uh, if you join me with congratulating Thanks. and thanking Jen. <coughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Lovely. Well done.